Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, where scientists, engineers come together to chat about a common interest, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Ellie and in this episode I'm joined by Laura, Emma and Antonia to talk about the Nobel Prizes, what it takes to win one and some of our favourite bits of science that have managed to achieve that goal. So to start off, Laura, what do you know about the Nobel Prizes? Uh, the thing that gets me about the Nobel Prizes is that a lot of them were awarded for really fundamental science. Generally, back when the Nobel Prizes first started being awarded, sort of um, in the early 1900s. Yeah. And this is the sort of stuff that you get taught about in school now. I also noticed when I was looking through the list that some others have been made for general contributions. I think Albert Einstein just had a generally for being really good at doing science. <laughs> <laughs> which i liked um i mean it's not like einstein didn't make significant discoveries but they just decided a, an all-encompassing award was good enough yeah it's like we don't know you're just you're really good at doing stuff you, you contribute quite a lot have a prize <laughs> that's nice that seems kind yeah so i quite like that idea you can get a general nomination just for being a good scientist <laughs> Rather than doing Yeah, that. why not? Yeah, you don't have to do one really specific thing. You can just be a, a general scientist. So I've been exploring how you get one. And it's pretty cloak and dagger from what I can work out. So basically, you have to be nominated by a nominator. And that person has to be relatively high up in like a university institution or a research group or something like that. But what is really sneaky about it is they're not allowed to tell the person, presumably, or anyone else who they've nominated for 50 years. And then after 50 years, that list gets published on the website. And you can see like people have been nominated for like consecutive years, like sometimes as much as like 25 or 40 times over different years. And they would never know if they didn't win that they were on the list, which I think is fascinating and very like mysterious. What do you reckon, Antonia? I mean, so many things, just 50 years not knowing. I mean, you could almost throw in, uh, wait, do they, do they say who nominated them as well? Not just these people were nominated. I don't because know. Otherwise, I... imagine doing that for a laugh and like no <laughs> one would know for 50 years who, who it was. You wouldn't necessarily think to check either. You wouldn't be like, oh, I'll just look at the list this year and see if anyone nominated me. Yeah. Um, and it's also like the thing like like sporting awards or like the Oscars is like, oh, it's just an honour to be nominated. I'm mm. just happy to be on the list with all yeah. these famous people. But this one, it's like, you don't know. You might think you're on the list, but you aren't. You give yourself an inflated sense of ego for 50 years, but then never actually win. So not so exciting. I feel like it'd have the opposite effect. Like you'd actually have a deflated ego because you're like, oh, you, you, it's all, it's all or nothing. You either win or, or you're just like everyone else, without a Nobel Prize. Yeah, yeah. I think. Oh, that's quite sad. There are lots of other prizes, though. I don't think a Nobel Prize is the be all and end all. Of doesn't mean you're the most amazing scientist ever. You could be brilliant in your fields, but the people nominating Nobel prizes just don't really know about it. Aren't that interested? <laughs> oh, that's, that's even sadder, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> You're so good and you never get any recognition. Emma, what do you think? I hope that's not the case. Because I like to think that if you do discover something extraordinary, you get the Nobel Prize, but then you also win all of the other medals. I feel like there's got to be some kind of overlap, um, you know, with how good your discovery is. Um, but also it's strange because I don't know why um, people hold the, the Nobel Prize in so much higher regard than you know some other medals and stuff which perhaps you know you get more money for um but everyone seems to has like a, a little bit of a buzz over the nobel prize and maybe because it has like more history that we all know about but um i don't know i like to think that maybe it's i don't know old-fashioned anyone can win a nobel prize if you do this and you get a discovery and you're happy with and you work on it kind of thing but i think the whole nomination thing like if you don't know the right people could you even get nominated and then, you know, you may never get your so deserved Nobel Prize, which is quite sad, I think. I think <laughs> this has taken a dark turn already. I know. It's, but then how important was the discovery? Yeah. Yeah, presumably it's something really fundamental to... So there's categories as well that we should probably mention. There's peace, literature, chemistry, physics, medicine. Is that right? 
Yeah, and physiology, medicine and physiology. Oh, and um, economics yeah. as well. Sorry, economics. Ooh. It's got a really long title. It's uh, very specifically, and I'm going <laughs> to butcher this name, the Spherics Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. Oh, so is that like a, I'm going to be a bit harsh, a, a worse one? Did they come up with that later? <laughs> It didn't start right in 1901. Maybe it's because we didn't know how important economic sciences would be. Yeah, that makes sense. If you think about like global growth since 1901 to now, like a lot more has happened and like internet invention and stock markets and all that sort of thing. So yeah, maybe we didn't know we needed one until more recently. Does that mean they'd sort of backfit a load of awards to early economic principles in that case or did they sort of start from that point saying you know what guys economics we need a Nobel Prize for it oh well they've given prizes in science to things that were discovered in the past so I don't see why they wouldn't do it but I guess it just feel a bit weird to like backdate the prize yeah I don't feel like they do that because they're quite strict on who can win and they don't like giving it to, um, they don't give it posthumously as well. So if you make a really cool discovery, oh, but then die, you oh. you can't get it after your death. I didn't know that. Good. Because the money is like just yours, isn't it? It's not to your institution or to some form of research. So I don't understand why they can't give it to you if you die. Because then it's not like, you know, you, you that money was supposed to be for your research. It's like that money could go, you know, somewhere. But what's the point in a prize? Is it to encourage someone to, to say, well done, do more? Or is it his recognition? So surely you should get that recognition posthumously. <laughs> is it to be like, you've done well, here, have a lot of money. You can go on holiday or you can keep researching if you feel like it. <laughs> like it's a lot as well. It's, isn't it nearly a million? It's three million Swedish kroner. Is that for all the different categories? Do you get the same for literature as you do for chemistry and physics? Mm -hmm. Oh, I would hope so. Otherwise, literature's <laughs> going to be really cross, aren't they? Well, but if you look at science funding versus humanities funding, science is generally gets a lot more funding from research councils because there's so much equipment involved. Yeah, that's true. Extra costs associated with running that, whereas humanities funding is generally for a person to do a thing not for buying millions of pounds of equipment. So I, just, I can see an argument both ways. If it's for the person to celebrate their achievements, it should be the same amount. But then if it's for the person to continue doing their work and the sciences tend to cost more, should it be more? I don't know. I feel like I'm saying scientists are all really rich. <laughs> Laura's buying, she's awarding the scientists more money already. <laughs> I mean, arguably, yeah. I, I, I don't disagree with what Laura said. So how are you going to discover the Higgs boson without the LHC, for example? The Large Hadron Collider, which would be phenomenally expensive to build and run. So expensive <laughs> compared to writing a book or some great poetry. Mm. <laughs> so I've, just, I've just had a look and apparently the prize for 2022 is 10 million Swedish kroner per full Nobel Prize. So I reckon everyone wow. gets the same. Oh, maybe it's three million pounds then. I swear three is in my head from somewhere. Hmm. I don't know the kroner to pound conversion, unfortunately, <laughs> but you could be right. Because um, it was originally from like Alfred Nobel's, um, I don't know if it was in his like will or just throughout his life, he gave money towards the Nobel Prizes. But then now I think like the Swedish government actually like subsidizes some of the money. So I don't know if the fund is like, the pot has like gone up. Yeah, so he did leave... Uh, great deal of money in his will to like the formation of the prizes and then the bank sweden's bank got involved later on which established the economic one so it's probably some sort of collaboration between the two about where the money comes from because yeah even if he had a lot of money in the will it wouldn't last forever if he's giving 10 million swedish krona to every prize winner every year yeah also i was totally wrong about the three million that is just not a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 10 million pounds <laughs> is like 800k so I, just, I do not know where i got that from i mean still pretty hefty wouldn't go very far in the sciences though really wouldn't <laughs> but if it was just like a bonus on top of you know your regular salary 
then you know true yeah you don't have to do research with it right like it's a personal yeah personal so it's up to you if you spend it on working at the large hadron collider or not i guess yeah oh which is actually um okay i realized what i was thinking of the um breakthrough prize in fundamental physics that prize is three million dollars and that was the prize that um joss and Bell won instead of the nobel prize some people say like her um supervisor won the nobel prize for the discovery of pulsars and then she much later on won this fundamental prize I remember like the reception people were just kind of like happier because she actually ended up getting more money than she would have. And then she ended up donating it all to the Institute of Physics to like donate to give different um, minorities in STEM. I think like paying for their know, research or things, which is quite cool. That was really nice, but yeah. also crazy. Like that, is that a personal award as well? Yeah. Or does that have yeah. to be for research? That's personal. Gosh. See, but then why is the Nobel Prize so famous compared to that one when you get so much more? Yeah, and also, like, the recipients of this prize, like, Stephen Hawking received it, and he didn't win a Nobel Prize. So I'm not sure if it's also, like, taking into account kind of whether, you know, the Nobel... Maybe um, the Nobel Prize Committee were, like, these people don't deserve it because they haven't released, you know, enough papers or they haven't got enough citations on their papers, no matter how kind of how much of a breakthrough it was but then the fundamental um breakthrough prize in fundamental physics is kind of recognizing the importance of like more maybe individual things i don't know because i don't know how many more papers joss and bell Burnell released after her like thesis you know at the time she was a phd student so i don't know if that had a big role in it yeah that's true because you have to be nominated by someone very high up so i suppose very high up people tend to know very famous people in their fields or the latest cutting edge research and so if yeah. she wasn't on the on the paper necessarily they wouldn't have known her so yeah maybe that played into it whereas later on she would have been more eligible for the prize that she then did win because maybe mm-hmm. it doesn't quite work the same way interesting laura i think you've got some examples of your favorite nobel prize winners through the ages Oh, yeah. I I was looking over the list and there are so many. I got so distracted. (laughs) Starting at the very bottom of the list, the very oldest one for um, physics was awarded to Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen for his discovery of x-rays, essentially. So going back to my radiation science background, the very first prize in physics was about radiation. And that kind of continued up until sort of um, 1956, I think it was, was the last one that I recognise as being for fundamental discoveries of things to do with radiation being emitted from things. And there were quite a few more that were about how radiation interacts with matter, then how we can use it to see the structure of things, which I thought was pretty cool. That is very cool. Yeah, so I think I saw... I'm trying to find my notes, and I have way too many notes here. (laughs) (laughs) The first guy, he discovered x-rays in terms of, like, broken bones sort of situation, or was it more fundamental than that? Uh, He was doing an experiment involving electrons, and he he thought things were pretty well shielded, and he noticed something shining somewhere in his lab, so he thought, I need to investigate this, this doesn't seem quite right. And it turned out it was something to do with x-rays. Um, there's a very famous picture of the very first um, medical x-ray image taken of his wife's hands wearing a wedding ring. And that's one of those things that gets taught in schools when we're talking about radiation and x-rays. It's uh, this picture of this woman's hand. Yeah, I think I saw that in school. I didn't realise that was like one of the first x-rays. Or maybe I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> school was a long time ago. Well, there you go. And this sort of continued, kind of split across the physics and the chemistry um, Nobel Prizes. So uh, Marie Curie, of course, and her husband, uh, they won the prize in physics relating to the discovery of spontaneous radioactivity emitting from radioactive particles, I think. And then Marie Curie won it independently later on in chemistry uh, for her work on specific uh, elements that emit radiation. That's pretty cool. I think it's pretty impressive that you can win it twice. That feels a little bit like showing off, but because it's Marie Curie, I'll allow it. <laughs> yeah, and in different fields as well. Oh, wow. Very e- extra impressive. Yeah, and there are loads of other names that I recognise, sort of um, physical constants in radiation sciences. Um, Henry Becquerel, Compton, 
Have you heard of the Compton effect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know it well. <laughs> Emma, the physicist is nodding. I've got no idea. I feel like one of us has to describe it now. I'm like, I know it's a fairly well-known effect, but try and ask me to describe it on the fly. And I'm, like, I'm not sure I could. Yeah, it's, um, ooh, if I remember correctly, like a relativistic effect of, you know, when different photons get scattered at different angles and it's all about how they scatter off each other and different objects and Compton scattering. That's what it is. How is that useful? <laughs> well, we did like a lab in it actually in second year and it was useful for us which I'm guessing is also the reason why it was kind of breakthrough Nobel Prize worthy was because when you accounted for the fact that you have like photons and electrons that are relativistic, then the angles that they get scattered off start to actually like match the theory. And so it basically is like solid proof of relative relativistic effects and how they actually changed the kinematics of, you know, different kind of interactions Whereas before, if you deal with it classically, then you get like um, that your experiment doesn't match with your theory. Whether that was what the Nobel Prize was actually awarded for, I'm not sure, but that is what my lab was in. So I guess it's important in understanding because, you know, like relativity, you often hear about it in terms of like the twin paradox or, you know, moving, you're in a spaceship moving close to the speed of light, but it's not actually got many kind of practical like you can actually see it kind of thing so I think that's why it was really revolutionary if I had to make a guess I'll give you that I'll give you that <laughs> we're explaining that on the fly <laughs> yeah. yeah I was yeah. like wait can I remember this lab yes I can <laughs> this reminds me of when you did the multiverse episode and I was listening to that earlier today <laughs> and I and I felt like oh my god there was so much science so much physics I felt like I never knew physics before yeah that was like a lot of research going into that before because I was like I want to make sure I re-remember my quantum mechanics courses and it paid off I think I'm going to continue with my sort of radiation science theme because from about 1938 to 1958 they started to get into particle accelerators and doing things with neutrons to make new elements so Enrico Fermi Fermi even um, in 1938 used neutrons to make new radioactive elements so we won a prize that's pretty cool yeah and there was something in here about cyclotrons that I now can't find so basically using particle accelerators to do things it's also interesting to note that it was awarded in 1938 because there was no Nobel Prize awards for obvious reasons of the world war going on so to sneak it in before <laughs> they took a break for a while I think it's pretty good going yeah also, a cool fact about Enrico Fermi is like later on when people obviously discovered like well the group fermions and bosons, they named fermions after him. It's quite cool. I mean, his research wasn't explicitly in that, but is that cooler than the Nobel Prize? Maybe I'd argue that. Having people saying your name and not really understanding why because you've got something named after you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most people get it after like a unit or a constant. He yeah. gets it after a is it an exotic particle or just a regular old particle? This is a regular old particle, like fermions and bosons. So like fermions being electrons, protons, neutrons, anything with like half into the spin is a fermion. Cool stuff. I definitely think that's like a, that's a flex, isn't it? Like a science flex. If you've got something named after you, even mm -hmm. if you haven't got a Nobel Prize, you're doing quite well. Yeah. I always think I want to discover like a new animal species. But you can't name it after yourself because that's like a bit oh. showy offy. But you need someone oh. to be like, oh, I'll name it after you on your behalf. So again, you just need to know some geeky people who discover animals and then like you could trade. Yeah, exactly. You need like a little like round robin going on. of like, oh, if I discover one, I'll name it after you and keep going. But then knowing my luck, I'd probably get something not very exciting like a worm. True. <laughs> <laughs> that would be sad. I'm sure worms are exciting to some people, but. You know, I want something cool. I don't know. You discovered, like, I don't know, an animal that everyone thought previously had been extinct. And you're like, you've got the coolest one. And then you don't even get it named after yourself. Oh, that's true. You know what I mean? Like, there's a bit of, like, attention if, you know, you're <laughs> that was the worm. And you've got this really cool, like, <laughs> it's from, like, the Jurassic period or something. Survived, like, millions of years. Yeah, that's a tough one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, have you got some more examples of funky Nobel Prize winning discoveries or useful things? I do. I've got what I think is really cool, actually. Maybe because I'm like more into the biophysics. 
But um, I thought it, it was interesting, Laura, when you brought up the first Nobel Prize because it's like groundbreaking at the time. But I feel like as time has progressed, the threshold for what makes kind of an amazing discovery has just like increased massively. And so I think you actually get a lot more cooler things, in my opinion. When you go to, <laughs> I'm like, in my opinion, in my opinion, when you go to like the later Nobel Prizes. So I was having a look at some of the most recent ones. And um, I really like the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics on um, optical tweezers um because uh, it's essentially like a high focused laser beam that makes this like optical trap um which you can use to measure sub nanometer displacements and also really tiny forces so um they actually ended up using like this technology to look at dna and like the different enzymes that um work in dna replication and how they work and what forces they exert, you know, to like split the DNA and things, but also like you can use it to apply a tiny force to different molecules and like isolate them and move them around. And there was also something um, where you actually could like build things up cell by cell. And I just think that's really cool that you can do that without destroying the cell, like you can just move it around and it's literally just a laser. It's like a laser <laughs> that works from momentum, just picking things up, moving it about looking at dna i just think that's cool i like you say it's just a laser like a laser pointer you can buy in the pound shop <laughs> i feel like it's it's got to be more sophisticated than that maybe it's a little bit more high tech <laughs> wait have you played legend of zelda the um breath of the wild i haven't oh, well the in in game you get a gadget where you can mag like it to be fair, it's based on magnets, but you can pick stuff up and move it around. That's mm. what I'm picturing, but on like the nano scale instead of just like this this thing where you're just kind of like because it also has a glowy effect because obviously it's a video game, yeah. it has to be visual. Yeah. And <laughs> and I'm just imagining you just like picking up these little atoms and nudging it along and then forcing things to move around. Um just like in a video game. It probably is like that, to be fair. I mean. I had something probably like that, but um, I was looking into how it works and it was essentially saying that the optical trap that gets created by the beam is analogous to a spring that obeys Hooke's law. So like you get the force applied, which relates to obviously proportional to the distance in the same direction. So you can use like one to measure the other and move things about to get a force. And I think it kind of works in um, that kind of way, which I think is really funny as well, because if you do an undergraduate physics degree, you get told absolutely everything is a spring or a pendulum. So <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> Turns out absolutely everything is. <laughs> yeah. So, so Hooke's law doesn't just apply to gravity; it applies to other forces. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, as long as you have, well, I think there's got to be something there to, you know, expand or contract or, etc. But essentially, Hooke's law is just force being proportional to displacement. So. I think when you get to really small distances, it just, you know, the force is always linear with the displacement, which is quite cool. Can you use it for anything like, like, I like the idea of moving tiny things around, but like, what can I do with it? Like, how is it good for my life in terms of like <laughs> actual, like a useful application of it? Because you mentioned DNA. So is it useful in like gene editing at all? Or is it a bit not quite the it right thing? It was really useful in understanding how like the different, enzyme works you know like dna like helicase or something that unzips the dna like where does it apply the forces and how strong is the force because when you know how strong the force is you can get information about how strong the bonds are and um so i imagine it's been quite useful in you know i guess maybe even with developing different enzymes okay this is me just like going off my own little brain movement now but um I don't know if this is <laughs> completely true but I feel like it'd be useful if you you know there's design of enzymes to do a specific thing if you know you knew what type of force you wanted to exert on something then you could be like well DNA helicase exerts this type of force and this amount of force so if we aim to replicate this because we know that amino acid structure then we could probably get a similar force I don't know. You know, like a, I feel like it helps you understand the how the different enzymes interact with the DNA, and maybe that also helps with like gene editing. If you need to like take out a gene, what the best 
thing. Best way to break the bonds out, sort of thing, maybe. Yeah. That's cool. I, I can see that working. I like I like the idea of just playing with a laser, to be honest, and moving different particles around and seeing what happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like it. It's just picking things up. It's just like, you don't think you can pick things up with a laser, but you can. But you can. It's wild, isn't it? They're, so they're literally just using light that's controlled in a particular way to move matter around. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, when you break it down, you're like, oh, well, light does carry momentum, which a change in momentum does exert a force. So it's kind of like a bit derivative, but it just feels like it's feels like a nice little, oh, I don't know why we didn't think of that before, but in like, I wasn't going to think about it before. Like, I feel like I never would have thought of that in a million years. And then you you see how like, it's quite, doesn't it feels like quite like a natural progression of what we already know. Yeah, I definitely would never have thought of been like, oh yeah, I can just pick something up with this laser. That I yeah. Have. Like, that's so cool. It seems like, like a tractor beam in Star Wars. That's what I'm mm. thinking of. Star Trek. Mm. Star mm. Trek. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it happens in Star Wars too. It's a similar. It, could, it could do, yeah. They yeah. do. Um, I was thinking when you thought they're using the Force, I thought someone was going to make a Star Wars joke then, and no one did. Was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was so close and I missed it. We got too into a Miss Physics world, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like how you were saying that the bar has been raised higher in terms of discoveries. They're more complicated. And I think this explains it quite well. So um, you touched on maybe sort of 20 different Nobel Prize winning aspects in this one. You're talking about structure of enzymes, structure mm -hmm. of molecules, use of radiation and light, how radiation interacts with matter. And they're all previous Nobel Prize winners. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. Do you reckon it's harder now to win one? Or is it easier because we've discovered so much that it like builds? Or is it like before we haven't discovered anything, so your chances were better? I think that's definitely the case. There was a lot more unknowns. And now I think maybe we're kind of at the point where it's turning to application more than general discovery. So like some of the interesting stories that I found were really fundamental technologies, but they didn't get awarded for so long, like 50 years after they first started working on it. And I think it's just because people found it and went, ah, cool, and not realizing any significance. So that's my take on it. Do you have any examples you could share of um, ones that are awarded with a huge time lag? Oh, yeah. So one was blue light emitting diodes. Why it's specifically blue is because it enabled us to have white light. But before that, this is where we start going into physics about, you know, mm. the the band gap and releasing a photon oh. of a specific wavelength. <laughs> Back to radiation science again as well. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the band gap, that scared me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you, it scares you as a physicist, scares me as a as an engineer. <laughs> so they won the prize for discovering blue LEDs or making... LEDs? Blue LEDs, because it could lead to energy efficient lighting. Whereas before we had red and green, they were kind of inverted commas, easy to get. Um, and then they spent ages trying different, um, don't know if the words compounds or elements and combining them. And they just kind of kept, kept seeing what different colors they got. <laughs> okay, that sounds quite nice quite fun. for me it sounds like they're just they're just trying different things until eventually they're like oh this is actually kind of useful so the, is the idea there that um what you pass electrons through a substance material and electrons sort of jump up into that valence band and then fall back down to their normal energy state and that releases energy and it's the distance in that band gap that dictates how much energy is given off and therefore what color of light there is i'm gonna answer yes but um they get excited from the valence to the conductance band yes you're right thank you i'm gonna agree knowing nothing about physics <laughs> not even knowing what a valence band is so that sounds good to me i'll trust the three of you <laughs> there are diagrams it's probably easier to look at a diagram than ask us to describe it yeah the diagrams are <laughs> there is a diagram here and actually in the diagram there is a fermi level mm -hmm. between hey. a valence band and a conduction band so there oh, we are again oh perfect <laughs> fermi comes up again so why do you reckon it took so long because you said there was quite a big gap between them finding this out and them getting the nobel prize so what do you think was the contributing factor do people just not realize that it was helpful or so yeah just to just go back into a bit of history the first leds were made in the 
1950s and 1960s. The blue LED was achieved at the end of 1980s. That's that's a long time of sort of getting different different elements together. And yeah, why why did it take so long? Um, I've just looked at the full description of the prize, and it was specifically about energy efficiency, wasn't it? And yes, how much of an effect this would have to things like home lighting and reducing energy bills, and therefore emissions from the energy sector. That's so yeah. interesting. It's interesting to think as well, like how much science has changed and how much we've discovered. And like they created the economic prize, but do you think like in the future they'll create different prizes for like different topics that are more like relevant to today rather than like we've obviously covered the fundamentals, but like would there be a scope for a new prize to come in? Laura, what do you think? Influential prize. Ooh. I can imagine that there could be something around sustainability and Mm -hmm. climate change in I don't know if business practice is the right word, but sustainable isn't just about climate change, is it? It's about the communities around a particular business and how they're helped. Um, So maybe there could be a Nobel Prize around that. I know there are obviously prizes from other communities and societies about those, but maybe something as prestigious as the Nobel Prize would sort of elevate all of that and make people more aware of it than they already are. Do you reckon people would try harder if they thought there was a Nobel Prize like at stake or would that just be encompassed in like the prizes that we have at the moment maybe just you know if you found like a great idea for capturing carbon out of the atmosphere or putting something on cars like an engineering thing that would completely take out all their carbon emissions would that go under like a chemistry prize or do you think they'd like come up with a nobel prize for engineering just for that oh see looking at the number of chemistry prizes that have been awarded for radiation science which could also fall into the physics category mm-hmm. i wouldn't be surprised if they do make an extra category so that they can award more prizes essentially in one year just to go back to is a sustainability prize there was um, a winner for the 2007 nobel peace prize which was related to climate change and that was the intergovernmental panel on climate change and al gore oh hmm. yeah so he won for, for something in specific, for like a sustainability practice? It was for efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change. So I think that might have been when Al Gore released that, uh, what was that programme he made? The Inconvenient Truth. It, an Inconvenient Truth. So I think it was that year. Hmm. So does that mean you could be an engineer or a business person championing sustainability and get a Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, it sounds so. like it. That's also a very quick turnaround the same year. No, sorry, I'm, I got it wrong. It was 2006, the documentary was released. So following year. Do you reckon there's anyone out there that like deserves one that hasn't got one? We'd mentioned um, Jocelyn Bell, but I reckon there's probably a few more people that are potentially deserving. If you could give one to someone. Oh, Hmm. Have you had the power of many Swedish scientists? Is there anyone you would pick? I say the only like one of the main things that stands out is like I feel like Greta Thunberg is maybe due one at some point because she's done a lot. She I would put in the same category as someone like Malala Yousafzai who did win. Mm-hmm in like terms of like being quite young like activism I would say yeah 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 definitely because I feel like she has been one of the leading figures in climate change and is also has been doing it for ages since she was like 15 um so that's the only person that like stands out to me on a science like point of view like I don't even know I feel like I'm not even like clued up to like the high-tech research to even say anything Laura, is there anyone you would pick? Who's the latest in the radiation field? <laughs> there are quite a lot of people doing some interesting discoveries in radiation. Um, I feel like it's become a bit more niche since about the 1950s, though, when like, the big excitement around radiation science died off. And now it's just lots of people kind of puttering away, um, talking to each other across this international very small community. So there's no one I can think of, but there, I think there is so many more people doing science now and collaborating with other groups that it would be quite difficult to pick out anyone that's really pushing boundaries 
I know there's talk in the radiation science community of trying to figure out like the origins of life, which might relate to radiation. So that could be something, but I don't know hmm. how likely that is or how feasible that is, that they could make that discovery. Yeah, I mean, that would be a pretty incredible discovery. Due to the way research works is you might end up not dedicating your whole life to a specific field or or topic. So it might mean that you just wouldn't kind of gain that that kind of momentum that people used to on and that got them the Nobel Prize like you know people kind of jump through fields and there's almost the oh what's the you know when you have a research impact score and that kind of thing you kind of almost have to chase certain aspects of research and it might not lead down the path of one single-minded uh discovery or breakthrough that is true so i guess sort of the way that science funding works and institutions are built up it kind of might make it a little bit more difficult to do that i'm not sure how much age is a factor necessarily although again this is quite a historic one so in 1915 bragg and bragg won a nobel prize in physics i think for their services in the analysis of crystal structure by means of x-rays so that was father and son and i think william lawrence bragg was in his 20s at that point hmm but I assume he was working with his father. And again, this is a very different time that they just kind of worked on it in their own private lab somewhere. And they were sort of, I imagine they were rich gentry people. It was Sir William Henry Bragg was his father. <laughs> <laughs> so they had the time, the means and the luxury to do this. Whereas I suspect that's not quite so true now. Yes, I think you're right there. I think you probably hit sort of quite an important point is that in the past it was different to how international research and mm-hmm. grants and all that sort of thing work now is quite different to being a fairly wealthy interested party that has the money and the means to explore their own interest as well and spend their lifetime on it if they want to rather than someone that's trying to get funding for a university to do a particular research project and not necessarily chasing chasing a prize perhaps but no it's quite it's interesting to see how far it's come and like to think about like where it will go in the future like, will people still be winning prizes in another, what is it, 120 years, something like that? And what will they be for? Hmm. Cool. So I think we've probably covered just about everything there. If anyone has any more comments on the Nobel Prizes, let us know. Get involved on Twitter. And we will see you for the next episode. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.